Okay, so good morning, everybody. Welcome to our um, um, March meeting of our constituency committee. Uh, I'll just move on to agenda item number one, which is apologies for absence. Steve, have we got any apologies? Chair, I've just received apologies from County Councillor Les. He's in another meeting and he's not going to be available until 11 o'clock. Okay, well, if, um, if we need him for, for an agenda <clears throat> item, we'll... Uh, We'll have to sort of swap things around. So just, uh, I've got to read this statement out before we move on. Um, and um, you'll have all seen on the, um, the statement on the agenda front sheet about the current decision-making arrangements within the council following the expiry of the legislation permitting remote committee meetings. I just want to remind everybody for absolute clarity, <clears throat> that uh, this is an informal meeting of the committee members. Any formal decisions will be taken by the chief executive under his emergency delegating decision-making powers and after taking into account any of the views of the relevant committee members and all relevant information. This approach was reviewed by full council at its February meeting where it was agreed to continue and will be further reviewed at the May AGM of the county council. Um, and also for the benefit of people watching today online, existing county councillors must not use this meeting which is taking place during the pre-election period to publicise themselves or any, any candidate standing for election or any political party. So moving on then from that, we've got the minutes of the, um, of the 24th of the November meeting um, and the special meeting on the 6th of January. Um, if if nobody um, begs to differ, I will sign these and as a true and correct record at the earliest opportunity. So if I've not seen any hands anywhere, so nobody wants to speak. So that one is carried. We will uh, we will deal with that at the earliest opportunity. So just to, on to agenda item number three, which is the de declarations of interest. Uh, just to remind members that of any to, to uh, declare any interests uh, usually sort of immediately prior to the uh, um, agenda item. So moving on to number four, then we've got, we, this is the opportunity for public questions or statements. And we do have a member of the public here today. Um, and this is Chris Brown of Newsham. And he's got a concern about the A66. Um, I'm not seeing him anywhere. I'm, ho I'm hoping he's here. So he's, if you not, he's not arrived at the moment, but I do have the question. So I can put that question to the committee. Uh, well, it's just more of a statement than a question. And then uh, Amanda Dyson from Richmondshire District Council is going to uh, provide a response to that. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So welcome, Amanda, to the meeting. Um, so, Steve, you, you do that and, and hopefully the gentleman concerned will turn up um, and we will give him a chance to speak at some stage. Right. The Excuse me, Chair. I think Mr Gibson Brown is here. If you go onto the large screen, you can see him. Um, <laughs> I'm, not see I'm not seeing him. Mr Brown, are you, are you, are you the, in the meeting today? He is. He's on mute. You're on mute, Mr. Brown. Sorry, Councillor Wilkinson. Sorry is about that. Gibson Brown. that. That's why I didn't me. spot it. <laughs> I haven't seen him yet. OK, that's brilliant. I'm yeah. pleased you're here. Uh, we really do welcome members of the public coming to talk to us at our um, constituency meeting. So um, it's over to you. Right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. Um, as you say, I'm a resident of Newsom in North Yorkshire, part of the Richmondshire constituency. Uh, and really, I, I just want to highlight again the long-standing issue of the very significant levels of roadside litter on the A66 within Richmondshire. Um, for me, they reflect badly on the area as a whole, the constituency and Richmondshire Council, who ultimately are responsible for the cleansing of that section. Now, I have liaised closely with Colin Dales, uh, Amanda Dyson and the team in Street Scene, and they've all very helpful individuals. And they've given me a, a visibility of the issues and the challenges they face with regard to cleansing the A66, particularly the single carriageway sections, which frankly are appalling at the moment. 
and by their own admission in Richmond to accept that it's several years since they were thoroughly cleansed. And the main challenge is safety. And of course, we have to be very cognizant of that. And I respect that fully. So it means that really picking of those areas can only take place when the traffic is managed. It tends to be only overnight because national highways are very protective of closing such a major trunk road at peak times. Um, ultimately, as well, I did contact via Rishin Highways England to see if they might be prepared to accept the responsibility for cleansing on behalf of Richmondshire as they do for a lot of other county councils on motorways and trunk roads in the UK. They respectfully declined and passed the baton to the Department of Transport, who in themselves said, well, that's not our responsibility, and referred us to DEFRA, who replied along the lines that a pilot review is currently under um, progress on those county councils who are unable to fulfil their statutory obligations, the review is not likely to be completed within 2022 and therefore there's no likelihood of any significant change to responsibility in the foreseeable future. So recognising it's a long-standing issue that no other government department is yet in a position to take on the responsibility from Richmondshire and recognising the serious issue that we have, then my question is simple in that can Richmondshire Council commit to releasing the funding which will be necessary to provide the solution and therefore fulfil the statutory obligation regarding thorough cleansing of litter on the A66. Okay, th thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I do realise that obviously this is a this is a, a county council area constituency committee, um, and this is we, we, we've we've got here Amanda Dyson from Richmond District Council. Before I bring um, Amanda in, I, I've got Angus Thompson, who's probably the division member. He's got, he's got his hand raised. Angus, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for, for for that presentation, Chris. It it highlights the issue. Absolutely, 100 um, percent. I think possibly I should just say, Chair, could could Amanda go first? I, I received a lengthy email back from Amanda, uh, which was very informative, but I'd just like to hear what she's got to say and then perhaps I can come back after that. OK, yeah, I'm not sort of planning with it being a um, it being a sort of district council issue. I'm not really going to have a long expecting a long debate on this today. But let's uh, let's go over to Amanda. So, so welcome, Amanda. And it's over to you. Hi. Um, yeah, obviously, I've had various meetings um, regarding this issue. I'm the Waste and Street Scene Manager um, and so manage the street cleansing staff. Um, and as it's been said, it's our responsibility to cleanse the A66. Um, it's something that we admittedly struggle with um, because of the safety implications of it and the fact that we're constrained by having to work with Highways England when they have planned maintenance and we try and do that wherever we can. Um, we did quite a lot of work last summer working with them and cleansed um, the dual carriageway areas, which are much easier and simpler for us to clean when there's planned maintenance. Um, there's lots of pockets of areas that are a problem. Um, the area between Scotch Corner and Sedbury Home Farm. Um, the A66 is only planned for cleansing annually, um, but obviously the amount of litter um, that it generates, that doesn't keep it to an acceptable level by any stretch of the imagination. And we do what we can when we have resources available to um, clean what we can when we can. Um, the single carriageway areas are much more problematic, obviously, because of the health and safety implications. We're not able to put staff on those areas um, without any form of road closure in place. Um, some of the dual carriageway areas have large verges and areas that we can cleanse without any traffic management in place, but the single carriageways are not an area that we can cleanse in any other way other than close the road. Um, and we've been told that we can only do that at night. Um, and so to my knowledge, in the time that I've spent in the department, we've never undertaken in recent years any cleansing of those areas. Um, we have looked into what those costs would be 
and um, the amount of time that it would take and they are significant and they are dependent on having staff who, um, to volunteer to work those night shifts. Um, the task is pretty, um, it, it's not a pleasant task to say the least. Um, there are lots of bottles of urine, um, you know, various unpleasant things along that stretch of road. So it's not something that staff are going to um, willingly volunteer to undertake. Um, so we have calculated that there could be huge costs involved if we were to do this. Um, and so at the moment to date, we haven't done any further work than that. We just do the work that we can by liaising with Highways England and clean as and when we have resources available. OK, th thanks very much, uh, Amanda, for that. Um, can I just bring Angus in? Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate uh, your comments that, that this is a, a district uh, problem. Therefore, I'll be brief. Um, I, I fully understand what Amanda Dyson has said. And uh, uh, part of the road between Mainskill and Dunster Bank, I think, has not been cleansed in the last 15 years despite the fact that there's a statutory obligation to on the district council to do this. Therefore, I think we've got to get round the table and find how we can move progress on this matter, which quite honestly, the litter along there is an absolute disgrace. And whilst it pains me to say this, um, I have to say, and I did put this in an email to you, Amanda, um, that the single carriageway stretch, which is in County Durham, past Greta Bridge, heading towards Bowes is much, much tidier than that, which is in the Richmondshire District Council area. So I think we need to find a way of moving progress on this. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks. Uh, um, th thanks thanks for that, uh, Councillor Thompson. Uh, any other members want to comment? I've got I've got Bryn, uh, Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, Chair. It's a, it's a wider problem, isn't it? It's not just the A66. I get a lot of complaints in the Stokesley area from people from along the verges of some of the A roads and B roads of cross-border traffic throwing out uh, takeaway stuff. I'd hate to think what's in some of the bottles that I see as well. I think it's a, 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 a widening it out. It's actually a, a, an issue across the county and it needs a county-wide support for a solution. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Th thanks for that, Bernie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's really it's really frustrating, especially when um, Mr. Brown's been through all these different departments, and he just gets battered from one um, one to another. I'm just going to bring Councillor Wheel in. Just very briefly, Chairman, to agree with every word Bryn's just said, it, it is an issue both on local roads and on major roads. And I think major roads, it is the worst in, in my patch, the A1 is worse than the the minor roads but it's not just um the sort of wagon drivers throwing things out of windows uh, there's a lot of issues with takeaways um packaging from takeaways as well so it is a massive problem and it is a massive problem that's got to be tackled but you know as roads are more and more and more busy it becomes almost an impossible task to ask anyone to do Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, thanks, John. Yeah, OK, so I, 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 if any members have any idea how we're going to leave this, um, Mr Brown, you want to come back? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, as one of the councillors said, or yourself said, I have been round the loop on this and I've done everything possible as a, a lay person and a, you know, a parish councillor to ask questions of the relevant government bodies to support Richmondshire to do the job without success. So yes, it's a nationwide problem. I fully accept that. It's a major disease and more preventative action down the line can help. But in the meantime, the symptoms of this disease are so severe that they need treatment. And I have no confidence that anybody in a senior position within Richmondshire County Council is actually determined to make a difference and find the funding because that's what this is about. It can be done. 
to make an improvement in the immediate future? Or do local residents and people who travel through the area continue to have to travel through what I call the corridor of shame? And it looks like the side of a landfill tip in parts. So my frustrations grow. Um, I have spoken to Councillor Grant, who assured me that attendance at this forum could perhaps put it on her agenda to take it forward internally. But I need some confidence, please, councillors, today that next steps will be taken to try and deliver a positive outcome to this. And I feel as an inertia, an acceptance and an unwillingness to take this forward, which in a private business would not be accepted. So who and how can pressure be applied to the leaders of Richmondshire County Council to appropriate the budget to do the job? And if I sound frustrated, I apologise, but I truly am. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm, I, I'm frustrated for you as well. It's, it's, but I'm just wondering whether that is within the remit of this committee. I'm going to bring Councillor Peacock in and then Councillor Thompson. And then we'll, get, we'll sort of fresh some ideas about. Uh, well, well I, I think there is maybe something we can do as the county council. And it seems to me that across the whole of the county council, this is a problem. So the, the way forward is actually to get a proper strategy for the whole, talking to all those who are responsible for it and find a route forward. It, 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 it's going to take some planning and it's going to take some funding. But if this is a problem across the whole of our county, although we here deal with this Richmond area, then I think a solution I mean, we have good people, and certainly at Richmondshire as well, surely getting heads together, we can come up with a solution. It may not be a quick fix. It may take time to actually get it rolling programme, getting people, as Amanda says, you know, getting the people who want to work overnight, getting things. It's not going to be easy, but I think if we have the will, that's the important thing. If we as this committee... And I did, uh, from what I gather, I might be wrong, but uh, maybe Stephen put me right, but what I gather, we can put things forward up to the executive of county council and we can say, we have discovered a problem here and we need you to look at it as maybe as a whole, not just Richmond uh, uh, committee areas, but as a whole, where we can find a solution where people can do the cleaning safely and funding is provided so that we can pay properly the men that are and women who are actually doing the cleanup. And when I am just put this point in, when I heard Amanda say the sort of things that are thrown out, well, I'm just absolutely appalled that people would do things like that. OK, thanks. Thanks for that, Yvonne. I've got um, Councillor Wilkinson. I've got C Councillor Thompson as well. I am going to go to Councillor Dad for some guidance regarding the executive. Um, so, uh, Annabelle, it's over to you, then, uh, then Angus, and then I'm going to go to Councillor Dad. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr Brown, for your question. I totally agree with what you've said. It is dreadful and shocking but it is across the whole county. And I agree with what Councillor Peacock has just said as well. Um, Highways England actually have been very good in my division and Councillor Wheel, as he has said, division along the A1. And I think perhaps we could contact them to see if they could help and chivy them along to assist with the matter. But it is actually a national issue. I was on the A1 at the weekend and I was aghast there how bad it is as well. It's really bad over the whole of the county. And I think not only do we need to take action to resolve this going high with our MPs and all working together across the county in other areas. But I think we need to go into schools and re-educate because that's where we're going to, it's going to come from the children to tell the parents or their friends or family, please don't litter the countryside. We need to go back and re-educate again. That's just some ideas, but I do think it is a national issue. So we have to look at it nationally and work together with other counties and other areas. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Annabelle. I'm just thinking: are we, are we sort of, we've got an issue here, a specific bit of road on on the A66. Are we, should we, we just be dealing with that at the current time, or are we looking at the bigger picture? Uh, Angus, over to you. Uh, 
Right. Thank you. Briefly, Chair, I'd be very interested to hear what Gareth Dad has to say in terms of taking this matter to the executive. But I think you've just hit the nail on the head this morning. We're just dealing with the A66 and the problem that Mr Brown has highlighted. Uh, I forget the exact terminology you used, Chris, but I think it was words to the effect that you'd raised the issue with Helen Grant, Councillor Grant, who's the deputy leader of Richmondshire District Council, who suggested it was brought to the meeting today or the earliest meeting we had, which is today. I think to, we've got to agree a strategy to move progress on this matter with the A66. And I, I think perhaps the way to move forward would be for uh, myself and any other Richmondshire District councillors to have a meeting with uh, Councillor Grant and the leader uh, of Richmondshire District Council and say, look, this issue is, has got to be sorted one way or the other. We've got to agree a strategy. We appreciate there isn't an open checkbook, but you have a statutory obligation to look at this and, and we want action on it. So that that's my suggestion um, as, as of this morning to take it up with the leadership of Richmondshire District Council. And, and if we, the more councillors who, who come with me on that, well, the better. Yeah, well, certainly, certainly, uh, I, I as, as this chair, would be uh, keen to come along. Um, I'm just going to go to to Councillor Dad. Good morning, Gareth. Are you are you uh, available? Um, I realise you didn't, you weren't expected to talk about litter this morning, but uh, can we just have a, a steer on on the role the executive could play in this? Yeah, I've listened with interest, and the first thing to say is I've every sympathy with Mr Brown, and in fact with everybody right across the county, because it's a blight on all of our lives, especially that particular patch. The solution, the short-term solution, of course, is for Richmondshire to allocate the funding on their bit of real estate and get it done. Um, I don't want to compare Hambleton with Richmondshire or one district against another, but this is one of the problems, isn't it, about inconsistency across the geographical area of the county that hopefully will be resolved with unitary where we would be in a position should the new members wish to have a county-wide strategy but i think members are also right to say this is a national problem and it needs dealing with it's the cause of it that needs tackling ultimately and um, so i suppose there's there's two things that could be done this committee can actually write and meet of you, as you've suggested to richmondshire that might bear fruit with the uh, short term acute problem that mr brown's highlighted along the a66 but also within your minutes make a note that you're raising this with the executive for consideration about how we tackle it county wide now whether we have the resources or indeed legal capability at this stage and i stress at this stage to tackle it is another matter but at least it's on the agenda um, and come the glorious day can i say that glorious day on the first of april 23 it may be an issue that once we have those district functions or the new unitary has those district few functions, I should say. I've got to be uh, very careful how I position this. Um, uh, then, of course, it's an issue and, and perhaps a project that, that could be looked at with a little bit more depth and seriousness. I just put in a note of caution. I think Mr Brown's already admitted this could be costly. It's as with any aspiration or desire, it will come with a price tag and that will have to go into the mix with the other priorities and challenges and demands that everybody has. So I suppose what I'm saying is, yes, uh, I think I speak on behalf of the executive, we are with you, but we are limited as what we can do at this moment in time, but other than make strong representations to Richmondshire on that particular piece of road and hopefully get it on our agenda for a future work plan, a future project and something that needs tackling. But I, I think the, the best service we can do to this issue is lobby nationally. I don't know, and I'm thinking totally off the cuff now. Um, I hate using one company's name in vain. But we all know that youngsters often go to McDonald's but on the way home from some rave at Leeds or Teesside or something, you know, midnight. And, and we know that a lot of those rappers end up on the roadside. Could we not have legislation nationally that forces some of these 
um, service station type operations uh, to be to be writing on in indelible ink uh, the registration number of the vehicle that's picking up the product. Uh, maybe a few fixed penalty notices would would perhaps help solve that. I don't know. There's a whole range of of, of actions that perhaps could be taken. But I hope that's helpful, uh, David. And of course, on behalf of the executive, we'll do what we can, but it is limited at this stage. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, um, Councillor Dad. Um, I, I do have a hand raised. I've got I've got Bryn and I've got John John Wales. So, uh, Councillor Griffiths, I'll come to you first. Thank you, David. Uh, just to agree with Gareth about getting the registration number of vehicles on uh, the takeaway takeaways. Um, that was mooted here in uh, Hamilton. The police officer involved got in touch with the local takeaways who were up for it. Uh, it then all fell apart when the police officer moved on. But it's a national thing. If your litter is thrown from the car, the person depositing it is responsible, as is the driver of the vehicle. But getting the evidence is the, is the issue, and that's a very difficult thing. It's a national problem, but Rishi needs to know about it. Yeah, thanks, Bryn. Uh, Councillor Wheel. Yes, Chairman, I don't want to prolong this one, but it's just a question, really. Um, presumably, the Highways Agency or Highways England or whatever they're called these days uh, do verge cutting. Now, um, verge cutting with the correct machine um, can, in fact, solve quite a bit of this problem. It looks a bit untidy at first, but actually solves it. And verge cutting, if you're saying it, the wide verges, then there isn't the safety issue that uh, Richmond have talked about in such detail. So it, it's it's not just maybe quite as difficult as we, we're talking about. So I'll leave it there, Chairman. Yeah, thank, thanks, um, thanks, John. Yeah, I mean it, it it does look it does look unsightly when we do do this, but surely there must be some technology now where we can we can get lift litter from verges and put it into a trailer, say, same as the old silovators for we use for silage in. Um, there's one for the uh, to think about. But at the same time, what we need to do, we, we're sort of like talking about the bigger picture, we need to get this problem, this immediate problem of um, uh, like number plates on, 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 on packages isn't going to move the litter that is already on the A66. Um, and so we need, we, we need solutions as to how we're going to tackle that one and, and possibly making the senior uh, Richmond District Council um, both elected members and officers, maybe maybe a way forward to start with. Is, is, would anybody be in favour of that? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Well, can I? If if there's a sort of will of the committee to do that, can I can I ask um, Steve to sort of try and set that up? Um, hopefully before these these elections, and get get something get something moving on it. Is that is that possible, Steve? I will uh, attempt to do that, Chairman. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, can, can I um, bring in Mr. Brown for the last time, and then we're going to move on? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I thank Councillor Thompson and Councillor Dad particularly for a willingness to treat this as an immediate issue, which is urgent. I sympathise with the view that it should be looked at on a wider basis, but 15 years without a cleanse, and certain councillors are suggesting we wait a longer time and perhaps wait till the 23rd or whatever of April 2023. You might argue, what's a year when you've already waited 15? I'm being facetious and I'm sorry, but immediate action is taken. Councillor Thompson, Councillor Dad seem to be willing to go to an executive. Hopefully that can provide some dividend. But personally, as a layman in the constituency, I'm very disappointed that it we're in the situation that we are. Yes, budgets are constrained and it's about priorities, but not to do something for 15 years. I am speechless and not treat it with immediate urgency. You know, I'm tempted to think, would the local press be interested in this? I really am. The groundswell of opinion among constituents in this area who have to drive along the corridor of shame on a daily basis is growing. I've done everything I can to help Richmondshire Council help us. I praise the team in street scene, but without the money, they can do no more. 
and thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Councillor Thompson, would it be appropriate perhaps for you to keep me updated with any progress that might come from this, please? I certainly will. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, th thank, thank you ever so much for, for um, co coming to this meeting. When you mentioned the press, there will be press uh, listening to this, uh, the recording. So um, I'm sure there will be interest there. Um, we will get on with um, trying to um, get some heads together at, at Richmondshire. And as, as, as it's already said, Councillor Thompson will keep you updated. So thank you very much. Thank, thanks once again for attending this morning. Thank you. Take care. So, so we move move on now, um, and this is um, agenda item number five, which is um, uh, executive member updates. Uh, we, we were expecting the leader here today, but um, he's not available. So we've got a very able deputy in the deputy leader, uh, Councillor Dad. So, uh, uh, Gareth, it's it's over to you for for our updates. Thank you, uh, David. I I think there may be a moot point about uh, the description of me being able uh, as a deputy but uh, nonetheless we will see uh, there's just three well the first thing to say is carl is on a uh, another meeting that uh, he really does need to be at this morning uh, concerning devolution and associated matters so he's asked me to deputize for him uh, on this occasion uh, three small matters i want well they're not small actually they're quite serious issues in fact very serious issues uh, firstly the structural change order which gives us the green light for the unitary council uh, 1st of april 23 has actually been formally signed now by the minister everybody i think from district council leaders and chief execs to members of the county council are aware of that as members will know, members of the public may or may not know, there are elections that will take place on the 5th of May to technically the County Council for the first year, followed by the vesting date of 1st of April 23 for the new unitary, at which point the districts will cease to exist. It's quite a momentous occasion, to be honest, for local government within North Yorkshire. Um, it's something that uh, some have railed against for years and others have championed for years. But whatever your view on it, it's an opportunity that we've got to make the best of. There are savings there to be had. There are efficiencies to be made. We've just spoke about uh, one aspiration in terms of, you know, verge cleaning, as well as the freeing up some equity in the finances. Um, it's got to be said that it gives it gives easier control with one authority rather than dealing with seven or eight it's a classic case is it not so uh, that's on structural change orders we've also got a scheme that members may be aware of countywide promoting careers in care and caring um, and headline make care matters you may well have seen the media offerings uh, on that it has been relatively successful but it's a plea to members and members of the public, you know, promote that because a career in care can be a very rewarding career indeed. Um, finally, I just want to mention the terrible situation in Ukraine and just give some reassurance to members of this particular committee that the council, the executive and management team are working very hard and collaboratively actually with our district colleagues to make sure that any evacuees that wish to come and have hosts in North Yorkshire are welcomed um, and that that is going relatively well I see on the front page of the Northern Echo today that a friend of mine and I think John Wheels um, as well is is one of the first to accept and host a family from war-torn Ukraine. And I'm sure in the best traditions of North Yorkshire, we will make them feel very welcome indeed. Happy to take questions, David, and I'm sorry it's not Carl. <laughs> OK, thanks thanks very much for that, uh, Councillor Dad. Um, I'm sure there will be questions. Anybody, anyone want to ask a question? Yeah, Councillor Peacock. 
Uh, yes, it is just on the refugees, and I know it is very early days, but I am getting now that uh, more the community groups wanting to find a way that they could coordinate or help. And, and um, am I right in thinking it's very early days yet to actually get in place how they can uh, support? I know they can go on the government site, but for locally, uh, is there any more movement on that, uh, Councillor Dad? Um, you're right, Yvonne, it's, it is early days. We are working, I understand, it's not my brief actually, but from the conversations I've overheard, we are working with community organisations, especially to support the evacuees. I, I prefer to call them evacuees, I don't know why, really. Um, uh, once they're here, to support them, get them to school and, and clothing that may be needed, because let's not forget some of these people have arrived with nothing but you know, the clothes are stand up in. It's a terrible situation, really. But that network that was developed through COVID um, could spring into action again, I am sure, and we're working towards that in terms of support from or for our uh, friends from Ukraine. So you're right, we're working on it, and it's certainly on the agenda to be pursued. Thank you. OK, well, I think uh, we don't have any more questions unless I'm missing... Oh, Councillor Griffiths, Griffiths, go in. Thank you. I had a bit of IT problem there. Um, yeah, I'm getting quite a lot of pressure in the Stokesy community at how they can help. And I've been distributing the messages from county. They're wanting to run before they can walk some of these communities. Um, the town council will be keen to help with uh, coordination if we can do it, uh, uh, if we can help at all. Uh, we're happy to set up social links networks to help support range social groups, etc. So as soon as the county can put uh, give us a go ahead, we're happy. We're happy to help, and I think everybody will be, quite frankly. So the offer's there when you need it, Gareth. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Bruno. I'm sure we're in the next agenda item. Um, I'm sure that we may touch on uh, on on this again anyway. Um, so if there's no further questions. Um, just just thank, thank uh, Councillor Dad for uh, attending today. Um, uh, obviously, uh, thanks for your um, the comments on the on the waste situation as well. It was being very useful that you were you were here, um, and um, hopefully you'll stay for the as much of the meeting as you can because you never know when when you might be needed again. <laughs> so so with that. Um, We'll David, can I, can I just jump in? I really have to get back to this meeting that I've sort of left with with Carl, so I'm sorry okay. about that. Yeah, yeah, if there okay. is anything, you know, drag me back in. Right. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Gareth, um, and we'll let, you, we'll let you go. So moving on then to um, agenda item number six, and this is the Stronger Communities and Community Response to covid uh, and you will update. A uh, great pleasure today to welcome um, Adele Wilson Hope and Lucy Moss Blundell uh, to the meeting today. Um, I'm, I'm seeing your picture, Adele. I'm not seeing Lucy. So, I'm, is that is that a, a cue that you're going to go first? <laughs> It is. Thank you. Sorry, can I, can I just jump in? I need to declare an interest, uh, David, uh, Chairman, because of um, on the Upper Dale Community Partnership, whereupon grants have been received through the community, uh, you know, put it this way, it's part of this item of grants, so I need to declare that interest. OK, that's noted. Thanks, Yvonne. OK, then, Adele, back to you. Thank you, Chair, and, and morning, everybody. Um, so you'll see the report in your pack. Uh, the purpose of this is to provide you with your annual update in terms of what we've been doing in stronger communities, but equally to look at the support that's been provided to and by local communities in response to the pandemic. So as you're aware, two years ago this week, um, stronger communities were tasked with developing and mobilising community support infrastructure. And we worked with 23 key trusted voluntary sector partners to quickly put in place that safety net of support for people who didn't have family, friends or neighbours to call on if they were self-isolating or if they were shielding. 
And a number of support, act, uh, support activities have been delivered, for example, shopping and prescription delivery, befriending. However, and you'll all know from your divisions, we have seen those models evolve to meet local need. And the model has been adapted so that services can still be delivered within the varying levels of restrictions we've seen over the last two years. And I think the activity levels speak for themselves. As you can see in section 3.1, over 200,000 volunteer hours have facilitated over 23,000 prescription deliveries, 36,000 shopping deliveries, and nearly 50,000 meals have been delivered. So alongside this, Stronger Communities ran a small scale grant scheme, and that's allowed communities and groups to continue to respond to the pandemic, um, but equally to recover from the pandemic as well and provide some tra uh, transitional activity. And so far this year, it, there's been about £120,000 worth of small grants distributed across the county under that scheme. So CSOs have been in place for the last two years and, and we're now entering a period of recovery. Uh, Self-isolation requirements were, were dropped in February and therefore we have started discussions about winding down or scaling back that response activity. And that might see some CSOs winding down. However, the discussions that we've been having with them all, the majority of them are interesting on building the successful place-based model that's been put in place and developing it further to explore how we can contribute collectively to health and wellbeing outcomes in our communities. So budgetary provision has been put in place to support that transition work and those discussions, and there'll be further details available shortly on the outcome of that. So as you will see in section uh, four, there have also been a number of other COVID related work streams that the programme have been working on. That's included the development of ongoing sustainable food support through the various grant schemes that have been delivered. And we are just about to start work uh, with City of York Council to try and better understand the food insecurity landscape across the region. Um, we've also worked on the holiday activities and food programme, which has now been confirmed as being in place until 2025. We've supported the delivery of the £3.5 million household support fund over the winter period. And we continue to develop and grow Reboot North Yorkshire, which is our digital inclusion project. Uh, the programme also continues to work with our colleagues in Children and Young People Service very closely to lead and coordinate the school readiness pilot in Rydale and Scarborough. And more recently, we've supported the launch of their Get Going grant, which is uh, allowing community groups to build their capacity and to deliver some activities in their local communities. Relationships continue to be strengthened with our NHS partners. Uh, we are leading and coordinating the suicide prevention grants programmes across the county. And we're also working on the transforming community mental health programme with our colleagues at the CCGs. And more broadly, we still continue to work with all of our community assets and our infrastructure. And over the last two years, we have helped various organisations through what has been a really, really challenging period for them. Um, whether that's been restructuring their organisations, remodelling their services and equally helping to support fundraising and income generation, which has been quite significantly impacted throughout the pandemic. So you'll see at section seven, we've included a local area update for the Richmondshire constituency area. Um, that area is covered by six CSOs. So we have four in Richmondshire and two in the proportion of Hambleton that are covered by this area. And supported by networks and volunteers, they have all continued uh, to offer that core support that I previously mentioned. But we have had an increasing level of that transition and recovery activity. And that's to help build people's levels of confidence and independence and to try and support them to re-engage in their communities after, after a very unsettled period. And around £20,000 worth of community grants have been awarded across the constituency area. And we've had a number of community and volunteer thank you events which took place in between the restrictions um, last autumn to acknowledge the amazing efforts of everybody that's been involved um, throughout the pandemic response period. So that concludes the report. It was a whistle stop tour. Um, thank you very much for your time and it's recommended that members note the contents. Thank you very much Chair. Yeah th thank you very much Adele. Um, do, are we bringing Lucy at, at this stage to say anything or uh, uh, is she just here to answer questions? We're just both here to answer questions in case there's okay. anything locality based, but thank you very much. I, I am right. the uh, councillor Hugill if anyone has any Richmondshire uh, specific questions. 
Excellent. Right. So we'll we'll start with uh, Councillor Moorhouse. Yes, yeah, so mine isn't a question. I'm sure I speak for all the committees here. I just want to mention the team that, you know, you've already raised up to the challenge. Nobody predicted happening, what was going to happen, how long it was going to last. But, you know, the feedback I've got from my locality in Stokesley is they've got support from all around. And I just want to say, you know, well done. And I'm sure it's been very challenging. It's a 24 7 situation. And you've all come out the other side all right. You all look as if you've managed quite well. And, and it, I'm pleased that we were there, you know, we were there when the need was. And uh, I think that is that says it all. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Heather. I endorse that. Um, have we got any, any more questions? Uh, we've, got a tech, we've got a text here from Great Work by Adele and the team from Councillor Griffiths. Um, we don't have any more. I just want to, as, as, as you said, um, you've, you're de de dealing with the COVID-related issues all, all year, but obviously you've got, you've got to keep going with the uh, uh, with the day job as well. And I think just sort of give you thank thanks about the, the the work you've done with the Billsdale Mast and the project the project re restore. And uh, I'm still getting calls now regarding. Uh, can, can we get them back on? And uh, Councillor Moorhouse and I even were, were up at the mast a couple of weeks ago looking at all the work going on. So um, there's been a bit, of, a bit of great work there. And you can't put a price on restoring somebody's TV. It's uh, it's it's fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring in um, Yvonne Peacock now. Councillor Peacock? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I suppose one of the questions I would ask is that we know that, uh, you know, through COVID and the work that all these volunteers did and these community groups were unbelievable because we know that, <clears throat> let's face it, they were going off looking for food at nine o'clock at night at Tesco's because of, for some reason, something. I mean, it, it, it's been unbelievable what what they've actually done. But, I mean, at the moment, we have got this uh, cost of living crisis. I'm just wondering how much help is actually are you still ongoing? You know, just because all this COVID and things are over, these groups still exist, maybe not quite as prominent, but are you still actually carrying on? I think I know you are, but I'm asking the question, really. Um, Thanks. Um, Lucy, do you want to come in on this one? Um, well, I was actually just going to suggest um, Adele might be better placed. Um, I mean, the answer is absolutely yes. There are still lots of... Um, mechanisms in place but Adele is actually leading on a very specific piece of work around this so so can probably give a little bit more detail um than I can at this stage okay Adele over to you yeah thank you Councillor Peacock um yeah absolutely we are continuing to work with all of the CSOs and and I alluded to it in my update that we are continuing the discussions about how we build on and develop the model that has been so success through, successful throughout COVID and obviously you're absolutely right the volunteer effort has been staggering um and we need to be able to continue and maintain the experience of those volunteers, um, because it's absolutely crucial in our communities. In terms of um, the cost of living crisis, I have been working on something called Household Support Fund, which I did mention, um, and that was a £3.5 million scheme that we delivered over the winter period funded by DWP. Um, and, and we are very, very aware um, of the, the cliff edge that we've got in terms of the 31st of March when that scheme ends. Um, we are working incredibly closely with NILAF, so that's the North Yorkshire Local Assistance Fund, to make sure that people are signposted there appropriately for emergency support. Um, we're also working very closely with our colleagues at Citizens Advice Bureau around Warm and Well, which is particularly for people struggling to meet the costs of energy rises. Um, and we are obviously still continuing to support our food banks as well. We work very, very closely with them and also any other food providers um, to make sure that there is a sustainable food offer locally in communities. So, yeah, it's, it's very much on our agenda. As I mentioned, we are doing that joint piece of insight work as well with City of York Council because we understand that you know this is going to be a long-term recovery 
um, from the pandemic. Um, so, you know, we are trying to understand that landscape a lot better in conjunction with our York colleagues. And hopefully we'll be able to keep you updated uh, in the coming months as to how that's progressing. OK, thanks, uh, Adele. Um, Bryn, Councillor Griffiths. Thank you. You, you. you just raised something with me, David, when you mentioned you'd be you and uh, Heather had been up to see the Billsdale Mast. This is an issue raised at the last parish council meeting earlier this month in Billsdale, that the great that the temporary masts have gone up, but that they have got no mobile phone signal now, and they haven't had, they haven't had for some time. Um, EE put a mobile phone mast up, temporary one, in the pub car park, uh, but that disappeared, and there's been no replacement. So it's big strain on local businesses because the internet's not brilliant up there, and locals and visitors alike no mobile phone signal. I don't know if it comes into your re remeter, Adele, but perhaps you could rattle some cages at a higher level. Thank you. Thanks, a bit, bit off subject, Adele, but I'm sure you're the lady to deal with this. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure, um, but I'm happy to have a conversation with you, Councillor Griffiths, outside of this meeting, and, and we'll see what we can do. Please do, Adele. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we did discuss this when we were up there, actually, Bryn, and uh, yeah, there's all sorts of factors, but uh, uh, we, we'll, we, we keep putting pressure on where we can, because I'm aware yeah. of this, the, the, the issue. The main factor is there isn't a signal. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, any any more any more questions for Adele and Lucy before we we move on? I'm not see, I'm not seeing any more hands anywhere. Um, so, if if there isn't, then that's um, just th thank you both for attending today. And it, it is it's really inspiring what you do. Keep up the good work, uh, and 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 thank you very much. So, um, Ite agenda item number seven. This is an old favourite of mine. Uh, should be declaring an interest, but uh, it's uh, the North Nathalton Bridge update. Um, and uh, we've pleased to have Pam Johnson here today to give us uh, um, a report on how, how it, things are progressing. So, Pam, it's over to you. A very brief report, Chairman. Work is progressing and uh, the bridge will be completed soon. The important message that I'm here to give to you today is that completion of the bridge does not mean the road will be open to through traffic. And that's an important message because I'm sure that as people in the community see the bridge completion, they will be expecting the road to be open. Uh, in addition to the normal technical um, materials inspections that will be done on the bridge and the through route. We're actually ensuring that a full through route stage three safety audit is done. We've done the bits that have been opened, but we want someone to review the route as a full road before we open it to through traffic. This is the first developer funded route that we will open to through traffic that um, we've dealt with in all my time in highways development management. So we're slightly in new ground here, but we must make sure it's right. What, so I can't give you a completion date at the moment. That's with the developers. Um, but as soon as it can be opened, it will be opened. But once the audit, the safety audit is done, we need to make sure that all the issues that the auditors have um, identified are addressed in whatever form that um, requires before we can open it to through traffic. Okay, thanks, um, Pam. Um, when you say someone, have you got, have you got somebody, uh, have, you, have you got people lined up ready to do this? The safety audit is a strange one. The developers will appoint an independent firm of um, accredited safety auditors to do it. And all they will do is literally pay for them. The standards are set out in the design manual for roads and bridges, which some of you may have heard of, which is the Bible for highways design. And the audit has to be completed in accordance with the requirements of DMRB. The auditors are all accredited in accordance with that document. And basically all the um, developer does is 
go to a firm of uh, consultants, appoint them and then pay the bill. Uh, we have to, as a council, approve uh, the audit brief. So we will ensure that the audit covers everything, including the two roundabouts and um, looks at the route all the way through. Once that's sorted, it will then, and all the remedials are done, it will be open to traffic. Um, you'll see that some of the signing is already done and parts of it are blacked out because we're wanting to make sure that once the road is open, it actually takes traffic out of Fryerich Street, diverts traffic along the new link road. It's always been designed to take HGV traffic. Oh, okay, thanks Thanks for that part. Just when you mentioned that the auditors are going to look at the whole route, um, there's been a little bit of concern about the refuge islands in, in uh, at some of the crossing points. Are you, are you aware of that one? I am, and that is something. Uh, I'm just about to make a note. Um, If, if I can just sort of, while you're making a note, if I can just tell the rest of the committee the problems, and we've got, uh, um, obviously I, I sort of represent the people of Brompton, and we've got one lady, lady wrote to me, um, she's got three children, um, and she, she likes to take them either to, to the swimming or library or bike bay, and it, she can't get all the bikes and her pram on, uh, on the refuge island uh, at the same time let alone a poor husband, but we've sort of said the husband could wait and probably cross on his own, but the, the three children and their bikes and everything, she claims there's not enough room on those islands. Um, and I think it's a real concern if there's road safety issues there. Um, so we would be very interested in your comments on this one. Uh, yes, and it's a difficult one because I understand her concern, but... Um... There is a limit to the sizes that are appropriate for splitter islands. And to be perfectly honest, I think three bicycles and a pram is probably pushing the limits of what it's reasonable for us to design for. But what I will um, make sure is that the safety audit brief checks the refuges and pedestrian crossings on the route. I know there have been questions about... Um, pedestrian crossings on the route, particularly um, at the um, North Allerton Road, um, where it crosses there. So we are aware of those issues and we will make sure that the auditors consider the safety of them. And this is completely an independent safety review. Yeah, because I know I did I did see a sort of uh, an attachment of some regulations that uh, I think Brompton Town Council had got from the um, gov.uk website um, about sort of government guidance on this. Yeah, so I mean, one thing to be remembered is that whilst I know people would like a signalised pedestrian um, cycle crossing at that point, there are, uh, are guidance rules about the volume of traffic and the volume of pedestrians before you can put them in. If you put them in and the volume of pedestrians and cyclists isn't sufficient, it is prejudicial to highway safety. So it may be that that is something that can't be done at this stage because until we can do the proper surveys of the um, pedestrians to ensure that it is safe to put that crossing in, we can't do it. That will be something that sits with um, my um, traffic uh, management colleagues and the signals team. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. But it's, it's something that can be can be introduced at some stage, as long as we don't lose sight of the fact that we that we think we might need one. Um, can I just bring in now, Councillor Moorhouse? Morning, Pam. Now, this isn't a go at you, but I am a little bit confused about this, about I appreciate good have the audit has to be pushed through. It's nothing new. So therefore, as far as I'm concerned, when you have a contractor's in, you have a time scale. And in my, you know, my experience from the engineering industry, if they get behind, they get fined. And I mean, really, if 
are they working to the correct time scale of when this bridge should be completed? If it, if they are, that's fine. And if they're not, I suggest that we put some pressure on them and audit people. They know it's going to happen. Surely they've got to be. Obviously, they can't do it until the work's complete. So someone's responsible all the time as they look every week to see what projects go on. We shouldn't be on a like this could happen soon. There should be a time scale in any contract of anything, whether you're building a bridge, building a house. And I'm a bit confused as where we just seem to be waiting for things to happen. Sorry, I'm not going to go at you, but if you're dealing with contractors, they're the ones and we should be asking the question. And I would like to think if, if we have somewhere penalty clauses, if they don't get the work done, and that might shift them on a bit. Sorry, Pam, but, um, you know, these guys, when we when they undertook this role, are they actually doing it as, or are they waiting for something for us to do? I'm sorry I'm landing that with you, but we shouldn't be waiting for them. They should be on it. Uh, although if they were working for me, they would be. Put it that way. Thank you. I totally agree with you. There's just one problem. This is a developer funded road. It's not like Bulb, where the county council let the contract. The contract with the contractor is between um, with Persimmon Homes and Taylor Wimpy. It's not with the county council. So it's like 278 works. And, so, and in fact, this is a section, although it's going to be a new b road it's got it's already got a number right um, it's going to be sorry sorry about that in finding the road number b6271 it will be but it's been delivered under a section 38 agreement so I echo your frustration. I do wish we had the contract because things that have happened wouldn't have happened. And part of the problem is that, of course, the people who have let the contract are house builders, not road builders. So that's the problem. I have made another note and I'm going to remind the um, one of my contacts at the house builders that they will need to get this stage three safety audit in um so that we can move that forward um i have to say she's been on maternity leave but she's back and she's one of the people that actually gets things moving so i will make sure this is on her list one of the problems i've got is that my last working day for north yorkshire county council is next wednesday so I'm having to hand this over to other people and trying to make sure that I've pushed as much forward as I can. I desperately wanted this to be finished before I retired and it's just not happened. Things with the bridge, the weather, materials, COVID and everything, everything's been stacked against us. So we are, you know, we are where we are. And I understand your frustration, but it's not our contract. Uh, thanks, Sorry, thanks. David, I'd like to come back on that, if that's all right. Pam, Happy retirement, and I'm sure you like your wind sailing and off in the Caribbean, whatever. But happy retirement. But I will go back again. Uh, Chair, would you uh, be willing for this committee to... Precision Homes have built loads of roads. I'm not letting them duck the system. They are, they've done this all. It's not like anything new to them. And I think I would like to feel as a committee that we send a very strongly worded letter you know, not full of promises. We, we want to know. We would like some timelines exactly when this bridge is going. The concerns are, you know, people need to have that. There's been a lot of people, I'm not familiar with the area, but I know there's a lot of concerns and people not being able to use it. And I think as a committee, if that's what the correct procedure, I think we ought to be putting pressure on. And I think sometimes people go to the press, maybe it's time we did and just say they're not fulfilling their obligations. They're making the money, but they're not coming back with this assess one or six thing. So I'm a bit strongly worded, but I think we ought to put as much pressure as possible. It's gone on for too long, Pam, and don't you worry about it. But just give us the name of the next officer that's dealing with your job. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thank, Thanks, thank yeah. you. Um, what I would say is that the... It is. Persimmons and Taylor Wimpy have built a lot of roads in North Yorkshire. But Correct. when I say I've never built one that's become a classified road, they haven't. So it's and none, neither of us have built one with network rail. So we're all in new territory and they've not built roads. <clears throat> then the only time they've ever built anything that's needed a stage three safety audit is something like building a roundabout 
as part of 278 Works. They've never built a whole road that's need, uh, needed this. So it, we are all in new, a new territory. Well, let's hope they've learned from this then. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Pam. I, I, clearly, we, we could we could as a council do all this work ourselves, but the key thing is is that the, the we want the developer to pay the bill, and clearly that's what's uh, going to happen. Just one concern I I have, and obviously this is a lab funded project. Are we still are we still how how will that affect the funding if it's sort of um, an extended period of it not being in use? I understand the the funding. The LEP funding was to Hambleton District Council. And my understanding of the matter was it was for the whole road. And the bridge is only a small portion of the whole road. And the, fun, the necessary funding has been spent in the necessary timescales. And the LEP are aware of what is happening and how it is moving forward. Right, that's good. I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I was hoping that would be the case. Um, so we've got no more. We've got no more hands. Nobody else wants to speak. Uh, uh, just a comment in the text bar that uh, th this had been discussed at Northallerton Nath Town Council as well. Um, and and I think we, yeah, we, we this, obviously we, you've been a real star helping us with this bridge and coming coming to the meetings and t telling us what's going on. It does help us members being able to communicate to uh, the public. So we really appreciate what you've done. And and again, we're sad to see you leaving. Uh, any news on how uh, of how you would be replaced? Um, what 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 will happen? St I, I've I've been talking to Stephen about who will um, uh, provide the report. There's not a hundred percent certain yet, but Stephen has got the contacts to make sure that you do get a report to your next committee. Okay, that's that, that's that's fantastic. So, um, so with that, then we'll uh, we'll sort of th say thank you for all that you've done um, to to, co to communicate what's happening with this bridge and obviously I think it goes without saying the rest of the committee we wish you a happy retirement <laughs> and I see you by the nods so thank, thank you very much so we'll we'll move now on to um, um, our agenda item number eight which is the Catterick Integrated Care Centre um, this is something that was brought to us um, uh, as a sort of scrutiny project um, and I just want to hand over to Steve first to try and sort of give us some guidance on how we actually deal with this uh, this item. So, Steve, over to you. Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, this was brought by the, sent to us by the Scrutiny of Health Committee as an item that they felt more appropriate for local scrutiny, which is why it's going through the ACC. Basically, we're having a presentation on the uh, project this morning and searching for other lines of inquiry that we can take forward to further meetings to determine uh, whether we need to look at other issues in relation to the project and whether there are other issues that we need to discuss. So basically it's a, an introduction to the project and then we determine whether there are other lines of inquiry for us to follow. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Steve. So, so then to uh, introduce this, we've. Uh, I think I'll, I'm going to call on Lisa Pope, who is the um, deputy director of primary care and community services and uh, integration at the CICC, um, and, and the pro is the program lead. Um, so, um, welcome today, Lisa, and uh, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, you've got uh, my title and I'm the strategic lead um, on the programme. We're also joined by Dr Mark Hodgson, who's the clinical lead, um, and Sean Paramore from our partners at Tilbury Douglas, who are leading the design work, and Georgina Sayers, who I think most of you know, who is our comms and engagement manager, um, and is going to drive the slides for us. Uh, so Mark's going to kick things off and then I'll pick up and pass on to Sean, who will take you through the initial design um, and then we'll wrap up and um, are available for any questions. So Georgina, if you wouldn't mind putting the slides up and um, I'll hand you over to Mark. Hi, good morning everybody and um, thank you very much for inviting us along this morning to give you an update on CICC. Um, 
which is Catrick Integrated Care Campus, but it's a bit of a mouthful, so we'll just call it CICC for the rest of the presentation. I'm Mark Hodgson, I'm a GP, um, been in practice in Albury St John for 30 odd years and retired this time last year. Um, I'm a clinical lead on North Yorkshire CCG and I'm the uh, clinical lead on the Catrick Integrated Care Campus project. So, um, I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction. Um, some of you will have heard about it, some of you know a little bit, some of you might know more, but we'll give a, an overview of the project, um, where it came from and where we're up to. So, we start, this iteration of, 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 of the, um, the project was, we started talking about about seven years ago and it's taken to today to get as far as, as we have. Um, the idea of the project was to provide a, um, a brand new first of its kind building um, to provide primary health care for NHS patients and um, MOD uh, employees housed in the same building, um, also providing a, a wide range of, um, of, of, of other community care services outpatients um, for the wider Richmondshire community. So that, 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 that's the, the premise that the discussion started. Um, looking back as, as to how we started, the reasons why we need, we felt there was a need for, the, uh, for this development. Um, there was con concerns over the, the capacity um, of the NHS um, primary care facility in Catry Garrison. Um, and also the MOD um, primary care facilities were um, being provided from a converted um, accommodation block following the, the problems and the eventual um, demolition of the Duchess of Kent Hospital. So woefully under provided services um, for, for the population of Catrick Garrison. Um, there was concerns over the, the mental health provision, children's provision, um, the, the people providing all, all the different services to um, the population just were scattered in, in equally probably inadequate premises across the patch. Um, so pe people wouldn't know where they needed to go for what service. Um, a lack of integration because of that uh, geographical location of services. Um, there was a bit of a lack of parity in, in, in the provision of services to the, uh, the MOD and, and the NHS uh, patients. And the, the general amount of travelling and, and rurality that, that we were trying to provide these services for. So we wanted to develop a, a facility that would address the, these issues. Um, could you pop the next slide on? So we, we started by having a lot of discussions with uh, an engagement with, with local groups like um, Parents for Parents within the, the garrison and any other um, groups that we could, we could meet up with. Um, the engagement has been stalled due to COVID. It's been difficult to obviously get out and meet with people. We've, we've tried to keep in touch with people as best we can. Um, in addition to the, the the lack of appropriate facilities currently, there was also the increase in population within Catrick Garrison. So there's a, a big um, civilian building programme and there was uh, thought to be a quite a big rebasing of personnel and their dependents within um, Catrick Garrison. As often happens with the MOD side of things, their plans change from year to year. So. The, the rebasing currently isn't going to be as big as we initially thought, but that could change again next year. So it's the MOD are happy to go ahead and um, de develop the facility as planned. Um, the, the armed forces and the families and dependents have, have um, unique issues, um, different issues to the general population and it's felt that providing this integrated facility would help address um, those issues and allow the conversation between MOD clinicians and NHS clinicians to provide a, a holistic um, care for, for the, the army families. Um, and you know, we are 
pleased to be at, at this stage in the in the development process and be able to start having these discussions with, with our partners. It's going to be the first of its kind um, in this country um, in terms of being truly integrated. Um, other facilities that have been shared between MOD and NHS have had a, b a brick wall down the middle. So one side of the wall will be behind the fence and then we'll, we'll provide services for the MOD and the other side will provide services for the NHS. This, this facility is going to be completely open, completely integrated. There will be um, mental health for um, rooms for MOD and, and civilians next door to each other and the same for um, musculoskeletal services, primary care services and, and the building is going to provide a um, uh, an extended primary care offer. Um, there'll be the out of hours will be provided there, um, extended hours. We hope to be able to provide some sort of um, minor ailments, minor injury service. There'll be outpatient facilities. We're looking to, to use digital technology to help provide um, care for patients so they don't have to travel so far to receive their um, secondary care outpatient appointments. Um, and we hope to be able to take services out from Catrick Integrated Care Campus into the harder to reach rural communities of, of Richmondshire. So I think that sort of um, gives you a flavour of the project um, and uh, I'll hand over to Lisa um, with, with the next um, few slides. Thank you. Thanks Mark. Um, so as you can see from the slide here and obviously from the introduction that Mark's given you, integration is absolutely the kind of foundation stone, no pun intended, of the work that we're that we're doing and it is truly a multi-agency approach to uh, the creation of the CICC. Um, as North Yorkshire CCG, formerly Hambridge Whitby CCG for colleagues that were around then, um, we're equal partners with the Ministry of Defence. Whilst we are not taking as big a um, share of the facility because we don't need the same volume that they need, um, we are absolutely equal partners in developing this and developing the vision and seeing the project through. Um, we're fortunate to have the support of NHS England and Improvement and um, po uh, po political support for this uh, piece of work stretches right up to the Chancellor, as one would expect, and we have support right through um, the various organisations um, at the top of the shop for us. Uh, we've also been fortunate to have the support of the Scrutiny Committee over the years and presented to you a number of times. Um, and we have other statutory bodies that are supporting us across the, the districts and the NHS family. Um, and kind of key to all of that and central to all of that um, is our interaction with local voluntary um, community and social enterprise um, organisations. And they'll form what we've called the bit in the middle, which is very ind indelicate and we need a new name for it. But that's about where we'll create the, the social value add of doing this and where we'll make it different, not just because we integrate the NHS and the MOD, but also because we create a community asset that can really start to service the multiple and different needs of um, military families and personnel um, in a very different way than has been done before, so that they're able to really see what's available to them and access that easily. You can pop on to the next one for me. Thank you, lovely. So. Uh, in terms of work so far, as Mark said, we've been at this since 2015 now. Um, we developed the initial PID, gosh, a long time ago now. Um, and then we've changed organisations since then. We've taken the initial outline business case through various governing bodies. Um, and that kind of takes us up to um, almost this time last year, where Tilbury Douglas were appointed to start to um, develop the design and build phase. We've now got initial concept designs developed, which look fantastic, and Sean will take you through those. Um, we then had a pause in engagement due to the design phase, and we're now start recommencing that engagement. And that kicked off yesterday with um, an event that Tilbury Douglas uh, held to start to socialise those plans. Um, and once we've gone through a few more of our governance processes in the NHS, we'll also be coming out to the public and um, patients then. Thank you. Uh, so we've updated the vision and I'm taking that to the uh, programme board this afternoon. But essentially, with the rebasing of the army personnel and the changing of those numbers and the growth in the non-military families that will be coming in due to the growth in housing stock in the area, as well as the change in primary care estates, the introduction of primary care networks, which changes how our 
practice this work and our move to the ICS as a CCG, um, we felt the need to refresh that. So we'll be taking that through and you'll see uh, kind of new, new vision and new branding coming online shortly. Okay. Uh, so our current aim is for the project to complete still in 2024 um, and there will be more detailed analysis of the service and building requirements as that goes on. Um, all of the work is caveated by being subject to formal business case approval, um, both in the NHS and in partner organisations. Um, but we've all supported and funded to this point the development of the preferred option, which is where we are now. And I'll hand over to Sean and he'll take you through the initial concept of the design now, which is the exciting bit and probably what you'd all like to see. Sean. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Sean Palmer. I'm from Tilbury Douglas Construction. Um, uh, and we've been uh, fortunate enough to win this scheme to deliver it on a design and build basis. Um, as Lisa said, uh, we've been involved since uh, February um, last year, uh, and we've been beginning to, you know, we've been having engagement meetings and understand exactly what uh, is required within the building with, with all the bubble diagrams and the adjacencies and patient flow. So all that background information from all the different services uh, and we spoke about uh, T's Esquire Valley being involved and Harrogate Hospital uh, and, and James Cook uh, and others and uh, over the years that I've been at Tilby Douglas I've actually worked in all of those locations um, so all that knowledge we can bring to bear, bear on this one. Um, so the, the scheme you're, you're looking at there is just the obviously in, indicative scheme that we've got at the moment that shows the whole site uh, down at the garrison, you've obviously got uh, staff parking and separated uh, uh, visitor parking and, and uh, patient parking. Then the building itself uh, sat in the middle. It's a three-story building. Um, it's a, approximately 12,300 square meters in footprint over the, the three floors. Um, and, and it obviously serves all, all the different departments that uh, uh, Lisa was referring to. Um, we've got uh, the next this next year all the way around to the 31st of October uh, to pull together our design and our FB submission goes in then. Um, and in terms of a longer time frame, then we, we're a sort of a spade in the ground from what you're looking at there would be, you know, sort of this time uh, next year. Uh, once we've, we've agreed all the costs, we've got the design, we market tested and, and then it's all signed off in, in the correct manner. Um, so that, that's sort of our programme for it. Um, on on the, the next slide, Georgina, um, you can see that's a sort of a 3D cutaway that runs down the, the complete spine of the building. Um, you can see that the, the large arrow there is where everybody would come in on the ground floor and you have, you know, you'll have your key reception area and your key wayfinding. Uh, obviously, with the, the all different sorts of people using the building from NHS to MOD, wayfinding will be key. Uh, and that's one of the things we're starting to focus on. So that cutaway just gives everybody a view, when, you know, 3D view of where it looks. The, the, the wings are four wings to the, to the north of that draw in a way a lot of the, the services are provided, uh, split over the three floors. And the central yellow area would be where everybody is waiting, split over all three levels. So you, you'll be directed to where's best to wait for you on which particular floor. Um, as you'd expect in a building of that size, that there's uh, that there's passenger lists uh, to get people around, uh, and, and certainly sufficient stairs. So it's a, a very smart-looking building, and we'll be using smart technologies as well within that building to help people where they get the way around it. So on, on the next slide, uh, that sort of a, a, a sort of the graphic image looking down the length of, of that atrium from the cutaway you just looked at. Um, that, that, that atrium area is actually going to end up being about 65 metres, 70 metres long. And as I say, that's the key waiting area for everybody as they come in. You can see it there, split over the three different levels. Um, we're, we're trying to create a, a bright, light, airy space, um, you know, that we can, the community can use a hub, not just that you, know, you sat there waiting for uh, to get called forward. Um, so we're, we're trying to create that the right atmosphere within that, with the right balance of materials, uh, but that that's you know all further down the line. Um, so that's a, a, a you know visual impression of where we are at the moment. So yeah, next slide. Um, that's the building sat on 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 the site. Key obviously with, with most hospitals, GP centres is parking. Um, so we've got separate parking for staff, visitors, patients there, split completely separately. Um, there's a large plaza that you, feeds you into the, to the building. 
Um, so it's all, you know, user friendly that there'll be uh, bus routes, there'll be cycle routes into that. And, and then you can see there's quite a lot of green space around there. So we're looking to enhance that uh, so that, again, it becomes a you know, community hub um, with, with there's a, there is a small calf on, on the ground floor as well. So it sits very well on that site and it uses all that current site that's there at the moment. Um, if, if anybody knows it, then know that there's there, obviously there's some demolition works to start with. Um, and then we get into these works. As I say, those works won't be till uh, next this time, literally this time next year. Um, where we, we are at the moment is sort of pulling together the height level concept drawings. And you, you can probably see behind me there are some floor plans that uh, we've, we've been working on. So those floor plans on the, on the ground first and second fit into that building that we've got. Um, we, we get them signed off in, in the next two or three weeks. And then it opens up a lot of the detailed design moving forward. Uh, that takes us through to the 31st of October. From a, a planning point of view, we, we've already had pre-app meetings. Uh, planning itself won't be till in, in late May. I think it's the 26th of May is the date we're, we're looking to target. So that's still a ways off. Uh, and the design's got to be developed uh, uh, and sort of fulled out for, for that purposes. But that, that there's some time to do that. So these are obviously the initial you know, high-level drawings that we've got at the moment on the sort of the, the, the base design is there. Um, it's a fantastic looking scheme. Um, and we're very much, you know, uh, looking forward to getting getting onto the ground foot of the spade in the ground moment, as it were. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's any more slides there. Oh yeah, that's just a, a, an end slide there, Lisa, really. So um, there, there were the, when we've obviously been involved in this from early doors, they're the key values that we, um, we were trying to bring to the job as part of the expression of interest in the interview process that gets us onto this as the P22, um, which, which is a bespoke building between the, the NHS and the MOD, and there isn't many of those in the country, um, particularly, uh, as Mark alluded to, the fact that there isn't sort of a firewall between the two in this one. It is a completely open building. Uh, that there, there is no security in terms of fencing and or security to get into the building. It's open to the general public. It's a walk in and walk out. Um, so it's a, it is a real bespoke first for, for the MOD and NHS. Thank you. On that one, next emission, this is more about the programme. So yeah, we're still on programme for that, Spring 22. Um, ideally, we'll be at the end of May, beginning of June, starting the demolition phase. Um, uh, and that takes 23 weeks through the summer months and into the early autumn. Um, so, so that's all ongoing. Our full business case goes in on the 31st of October. Uh, and then there's a there's a sort of pause period where that's uh, checked by the MOD and the NHS and they back up their own separate business cases, obviously, uh, before it gets fully signed off. But all the way through this process, we have formal design stages and hold points so that we're checking all the time with the end users and the stakeholders. Uh, is this right? Is this what they're looking for? You know, can we tweak it? Can we, can we do something differently? So that constant feedback and constant engagement through this year is, is what the key thing is. Um, one of the, the, the primary things we said was that the building of is sort of the easy bit. The important bit is the engagement this year with all the stakeholders. This is key to getting what we then build right. So, Brilliant. Thank you, Sean. Um, okay, I think likewise those next steps apply to all of us so um, obviously um, Sean will contribute to the full business case we need to complete that on the NHS side and the MOD need to do the same um, we'll then go through our respective uh, assurance processes which are arduous in both senses to make sure that um, we are spending public money wisely and that we're doing the right thing for the community so that takes time as you would expect um, I think I alluded to earlier that on the NHS side, we'll be stepping back up our full stakeholder and um, public event programme, as you would expect from us. Again, colleagues who were around in Hamrich Whitby days know that we like to come out and talk to people and make sure that we're doing the things that the public needs us to do. So we'll certainly be doing that as soon as we can. Um, in the meantime, we're supporting our primary care facilities to remain uh, safe and able to deliver high quality care that you have always expected and have always seen in North Yorkshire. They're doing fine, but they're very happy and looking forward to being in their lovely shiny new homes uh, in 2024. Um, and obviously on the NHS side as well, we're navigating our, our new world in the ICS and seeing what that means in terms of uh, bringing our programme to fruition. Uh, so I'll pass it to Mark for closing comments and then we'll open to any questions. 
Thank you, Lisa and, and Sean, for um, pr providing the, the presentation. I, I, hopefully that's given you a good flavour of what's happening, where we're up to, and the, and the next steps. Um, we're more than happy at this stage to take any questions that, that you have about um, in, any aspects of the, um, of the project. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the team for uh, giving us such a good insight into uh, um, what what's going to happen down there. Um, we've got um, one or two hands, I think, at Councillor Moorehouse. Thank you very much. That looks was a great presentation. It looks a really good facility, and uh, I think everyone in Richmondshire around there will really appreciate it. I'm probably jumping a bit forward, but I know you're doing primary care. But um, so obviously you've got to engage with stakeholders, and you've chatted with South Tees and Austin Coates, the Friar Ridge, and there's Darlington on your doorstep. Um, is it going to be, or is this for the future discussion, a 24/7 sort of um, operation there, which health is, as we all know, but often difficult to provide. Um, are you looking to do, for instance, um, you know, minor injuries or uh, will you have a paramedic ambulance standing there? Sometimes our, our GP, where I am, uh, you know, will you be doing any assessment, you know, to uh, just, you know, at the hospital as a preview to go on, on say, to James Cook? I mean, exact, and, and outpatients, or is this something you're going to look, obviously, when you're building it, you've got to think about what you're going to do before you put it up there. <clears throat> Um, what services that, you know do you think you can provide there? And obviously, good luck with staffing because we know that's a big problem. And I'm sure a facility like this will attract a lot of people. But are you able to give me any feedback on, on what services uh, you you know and overall um, what you're looking forward to providing? Thank you. Was it too long, uh, long a meeting for this one? But <laughs> uh, we, we could talk for a long time. But so keeping things fairly brief um, in terms of. Outpatients. We were, we were providing a range of outpatient facilities there. Um, uh, we South Tees have got quite a big presence there. Harrogate District Foundation Trust that provide the um, chiropody and um, children's health services will be working out of there. We'll have the midwives based there. Um, we'll have um, Chuv, the mental health providers, will, will, will be based there as well. So <clears throat> we'll have a lot of outpatient facilities. <clears throat> um, it, in terms of the um, minor injuries, we, we certainly feel that there will be a need f to provide some sort of of um, sort of same day assessment of, of, of injuries and minor ailments. And we're, we're working with all, all the partners, so the MOD, South Tees, who have the minor injuries unit down at, at, at North Allerton. Uh, and, and so I was trying to work up a bit of a business case about what we think the, the need would be based on the current attendances at the Friar Ridge and Darlington Memorial Hospital A&Es and minor injuries units, and and get an idea of of, of the range of of kit, the case mix that, that that would be likely to turn up there, and so the the, the medical um, professionals, the clinicians that we would need to to provide the care for those cases that will come through the door. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing that that isn't being considered, so. Um, that the advanced paramedics is, is, is an option that, that is, is working well in some places up in Leyburn, um, in North Allerton. So that, that is a, a potential option. Um, the Yaz were, um, were part of the initial discussions and whether they would want a permanent base on the site. I think they felt they couldn't, couldn't afford it. Um, uh, to have the, the ambulance site there, but that's not to say that they may not decide to at times have a, an ambulance on standby there, as, you know, parked up uh, next to the, the facility. Um, you asked about 24-7. Um, there's, there's no plans in, 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 uh, of it being open 24-7 apart from potentially the, the out-of-hours, GP out-of-hours service, which again is under discussion as to what that's going to look like in the future. Um, but it would certainly look to be open eight till eight as a minimum. <clears throat> um, so we currently have extended um, access general practice running out of Harewood surgery, um, and th that will be moving into um, the GP, um, moving into CICC. That's currently provided by the GP Federation um, of, of, of 
well, it was called Heartbeat Alliance. I think it's called Heartbeat Primary Care now, recently changed its name. They have the contract to provide that. They also have the the contract or they're taking over the contract to provide the primary care from Harewood Medical Practice and that will transfer into CICC as well. Um, I hope I picked up all, all your, your, your points there. If I missed anything, um, if you let me know and I'll see if I can answer it. No, that was brilliant, Mark. That, that was excellent. I think it, it's a fantastic facility and good luck with it. And let's hope the deliver on time. I'm sorry about contract, contracts, but no, it's fantastic. Look forward to seeing it sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, Councillor Grant, Helen, your local division member. Are you? Uh... Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, I, hi, I, I'm, tra I'm traveling. I'm in and out, so I do apologise. But I have been listening intently to what's being said. Obviously, this um, is in the slap bang in the middle of the area I currently represent. Um, I can't tell you how pleased um, the members of the public are that it's um, coming to fruition. Um, the only questions I ever get asked is, what about the existing surgeries, not just the Harewood, but um, Colburn and Catterick Village? Uh, how might they be um, affected? So I hope you can actually hear what I'm asking you, because uh, the, the connectivity is a bit lousy. You were a bit broken up at the start, but the the, the, the bulk of your question was loud and clear. So, um, oh, bless you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll wait the answer then. In Thank terms you. of the, the existing GP surgeries, obviously Harewood uh, are transferring into um, the, the new premises. Um, the, the surgery at Catrick Village um, and they run Colburn as a branch surgery. Um, the, the contract will be up on the branch surgery bef not long after the um, um, we move into CICC. So we're trying to work with Catrick Village at the moment to see how, how much they want to be involved in, in the new building, what their plans are um, for the future uh, around Colburn. Um, and, and then patients will be able to almost choose where they register um, and where the best sort of services are for them in terms of transport and and, and ease of access. So so th those discussions are, are, are ongoing at the moment. I don't know whether that was um, that, uh, adequate for you, Helen. Thanks for that. Helen, do you want to come back on that? Sure. Silence. Um, okay, we, we, we may have lost, lost Helen for the um, um, sh short time. Um, is there any? Have we got any more questions at this stage before we decide how we're going to sort of deal with this as a scrutiny? Um, can I can I just ask about car parking? Have you got plenty of car parking on site? <laughs> I think we'll hand over to Sean for that one. But uh, I think the easy answer is probably yes. But he he can probably tell you the exact numbers. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, I can. Two seconds. I'm just going to grab something there because it's on there. Yeah, if you, as you can see from uh, the, the drawings that we, we had up, uh, and in fact, even the one behind me, we've, we've split the car parking. So you've got uh, 148 staff parking spaces at the moment, uh, and uh, there are uh, 215 visitor car parking spaces uh, with a further 15 accessible um, uh, and another 31 accessible for, for the for the uh, for the visitors. So the total number is just under 400 uh, uh, parking spaces that maximise literally everything within the, the boundary that we can squeeze it into. So at the moment, that that's what that the drawings that we've got are showing. And obviously, when we go to planning, that will be one of the key things that will obviously get picked up in terms of parking. We all know what it's like. At, hospitals and places, but we've we've maximised every every spot we can um, while making it safe, secure and, and keeping the split between uh, uh, staff and visitors. So, yeah, that's uh, we, that was a priority. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Peacock. Uh, yes, it's just picking up on something you said to uh, Councillor Morehouse's uh, 
question. Um, it's the minor injuries, and I know you have to put a business case together for this. Um, but and you said that you said something defective. See just how many are actually going to North Allerton now. But it is often the rural areas do find it quite a long way to North Allerton, and I think it would be very good if if this could have a facility for the minor injuries because that at the moment doesn't seem to be able to have in your own surgery so I, I just sort of put that case in that it isn't always a numbers game because uh, in a rural area we don't always have the numbers yep um, I, I think we absolutely appreciate that um, Councillor Peacock and, and, and it's something that we do want to provide and uh, are looking as to how we can staff it within the current resource. So, um, yeah, absolutely. We, we would love to be able to, to provide that service there. And, and that if you look at the planning in close detail, that there are rooms currently allocated to, to provide that service in the ex sort of extended advanced primary care element of the, of the design. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you. That was a wonderful presentation and really exciting new facility. Let's hope it all goes ahead, so that's brilliant. I just wanted to ask, you mentioned about having a mental health facility and young, children and young people as well being there. Um, as we know, it's really difficult to recruit psychologists at the moment, and I wonder, do you see you're going to recruit through the MOD? Would that be an easier option for you? And if so, will the MOD uh, psychologist be able to work across the NHS? Thank you. So currently, Tees and, and Weir Valley NHS Trust provide the mental health services to both the MOD and, and the civilian population. So it's the same trust, the same employee, employer. So obviously, they, they need different skills to provide the different services depending on, on what the conditions are. So, yeah, it, 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 it'll, it'll work really well because the, they'll, the two rooms will literally be either side of the corridor. Um, they have different sized rooms and facilities that they need for whether it's the sort of PTSD type work or or whether it's you know, anxiety, depression in, in your civilian population. So that's all being considered and, and has been built in, into the design. Um, and another development which you may or may not be aware of um, is around the primary care networks. So I don't know how many of you know about primary care networks, but they're all GP surgeries across the country have been asked to, to, to work collaboratively in, in, in groups of GP practices serving populations of 40 to 50,000. So there's a Richmond Shire primary care network and, and quite a bit of, of development and money has been sort of channeled through the, the PCNs by NHS England. Uh, and there's something called the additional role scheme that is providing money via the primary care networks to employ different prof health professionals um, within the primary care setting. Um, it, it started with um, care navigators, social navigators, and, um, and, and that, that the CICC will be a sort of hub for people for, for, for signposting them to, um, to various um, charities or exercise classes or support networks. Um, to help sort of extend the prevention um, um, agenda as well as stopping people from you know, developing, getting worse, becoming more isolated, that sort of thing. But other, other additional roles, professionals that are being appointed at the moment are um, psychologists, uh, me mental health practitioners who will be working in primary care so that I mean, they actually started in some places, but you will be able to phone up your GP surgery. Um, you may get asked a little bit about your, your, the nature of your your, 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 your problem and um, if you're happy to talk about it. It'll be done in a very um, gentle, supportive way. And then you may get offered a, a, an appointment directly with a, a mental health practitioner if that's the nature of, of your, 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 your inquiry. Physiotherapists are another one that that, um, that, that, that are, are being developed in primary care called first contact physiotherapists. So if you ring up with a, a sore shoulder, rather than going to see your GP who, who might say, you know, you take some ibuprofen and, and see a physio and you then have to wait for four weeks to, to be seen by the physio, you may be able to ring up and just book an appointment direct with the physiotherapist. So 
it, it's all designed to help support primary care and, and CICC will be a hub for, for some of these additional roles um, and be able to provide the accommodation because a lot a lot of GP surgeries just don't have the room for new new, new roles. So you know, CICC will be a, a, a great opportunity to be a bit of a hub for these additional roles. Thank you. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Annabelle. Um, I've only got one hand showing, and that's that's Helen Grant. Are you are you still with us, Helen? Or is it a legacy hand? We've got yeah. I think we I think we must have lost Helen. So so that's um. Chairman, I think I'm that's, not that's sure the, Helen's connected still. Yeah. So that's 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 really a good introduction to. Uh, um, to this project and and sort of and, and it sort of forms the basis of uh, the scrutiny that we'll will be performing. Um, I, I would suggest that I think as 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 it's constructed, we need regular updates. I don't I don't, I don't want to compare it to an Athalaton bridge, but that's the sort of thing where we get sort of um, an update on on progress and until we get to the stage where things are working, and then we can we can look at how they're working. Yeah, we'll be more than happy to to come whenever you, you you'd like us to, and uh, and let you know where we're where we're up to. Right, that's, that's excellent. We'll leave it we'll leave it at that, and and it's obviously one for um for the new council um and the the, the new committee. So so say so thank you very much for you for the whole team for attending today and giving us that useful insight. Um, it's so, thank you. Thank, thank you. So that takes us on to agenda item number nine, which is the um, the work program. Um, so, Steve, over to you. Thanks, Chair. I'll uh, write the CICC into the work program so we get regular updates and see how that's developing as it goes along. Uh, this is the final meeting of this council term, so the work program will be for the new committee to develop after the elections. Therefore, there's little to be said in terms of the work programme at this stage and we'll be carrying some issues forward for the new committee and they'll determine whether they want to pursue those or whether they want to pursue new issues. Thanks, Chair. Thank, thanks, um, thanks, Steve. Yeah, OK, so move on to uh, <laughs> um, following on from that, the date and um, time of the next meeting. And as Steve just said, that is the uh, our last meeting. Um, and the next scheduled meeting will be held on the 8th of June. Um, for those of you us, uh, that will be uh, here, um, and so that it, this is this will be my this is my last meeting as chairman. Um, I, uh, I want to thank you all for helping me uh, in the last uh, few months that I've been chairman. Um, it didn't get off to the best of starts when I got bitten by that dog, but uh, apart from that, we've uh, um, I think we've 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 done some good good stuff. Um, I think one regret I've got is the flooding um, scrutiny hasn't sort of yet come to a conclusion, mainly because of uh, the difficulty in getting the environment agency round the table. But we've done that now, and I'm sure Steve will be writing up a report. And as we move into the new council, I'm sure that will report will be available. I'm fairly confident that it's going to be a, a, a sort of important piece of work and it's going to be very helpful to communities um, once we've, uh, we've, we've, we've got this because there's, there's a lot there's a lot in there and uh, as I say thanks to the support of Annabelle and Yvonne on that one as well. Um, and so that's that's um, that's that one. We just have one piece of um, any other business and that uh, and that is, and I don't think Karen's with us today. This is on County Councillor Karen Sedgwick's uh, nomination for um, an appointment to the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Barnett Charity, which is in East Witten. Um, and so we've got a nomination for this charity. Um, are we, we sure Karen's not here, is she? She could have told us about the charity. She's, she's not, Chair, no. So yeah, so we've got a nomination of Mr. Graham Rhodes that is uh, has been nominated by Karen to um, to sit on this uh, uh, to sit to sit on this charity, and unless anybody says different, um, and I've got a I've got a hand here for Yvonne. Do you want to just come in quickly, Yvonne? You might tell us about the 
Or was it a legacy hand? And you on mute. <laughs> it isn't a legacy hand. It was just I wanted to mention something on the work program, and that's what it really. Oh, was. sorry, sorry. But okay, actually, well, I do remember. Gonna... I can say something about this trust because my sister used to be on it, and uh, it's a very worthwhile trust. Uh, I can't tell you quite this. Uh, it's been a very long-standing trust that goes back, uh, you know, sort of decades, as you might say, maybe into the last century. And and so uh, it's very good at uh, giving out funding to communities. Um, it's an excellent trust. That's all I can give you on that. Yeah, OK. Well, so so basically on Mr Graham Rhodes then, he's been nominated by Karen. Um, unless anybody objects, um, I, I will... We, we will approve that um, that Mr. Graham Rhodes is uh, appointed to this uh, trust. I think, yeah, so that, that's that's carried. And we will come back to you, with Yvonne, on the work programme. Uh, well, I think you actually then mentioned it, and it's just so important that I think we said at the 8th of June, regardless of who's here, what committee, that it is important to get that flood report to the 8th of June because we, there's a lot of work been going on and I think it's uh, something that does affect residents so much. So I'm just sort of putting the marker down to have it on the 8th of June. OK, yeah. Heather, you've got your hand up. Yeah, yeah, David, I think on behalf of the committee, I think we want to thank you for chairing. Uh, you know, we've got things done and uh, thank you very much indeed uh, uh, as chairing and Steve as well. Thanks very much. And of course, Yvonne as, uh, as, as Vice Chairman as well. Yeah. Okay, then. Yeah, so sorry, I'm no sorry. Is that, is that, yeah. So, any, if there's no further business, then I will uh, um, wish you all an enjoyable rest of the day and declare the meeting closed. Thank you. <laughs>